thought I was in a cheerleading session until I bumped into Ezra and I was like, nope, we're in the right session. All right, well, we're gonna spend some time talking about patients who um, are more difficult. Um, there's a variety of patients that meet these criteria and I think just a little bit of knowledge and understanding is gonna help people identify these folks ahead of time and potentially avoid some of those complications and problems that we just uh, saw. These are my disclosures. Uh, some of these companies I work for do make uh, gastrostomy tubes. Uh, I will not be talking about any specific gastrostomy tubes today. So I'm gonna review sort of my general preoperative evaluation and how we figure out and highlight who's gonna be high risk. Um, we wanna talk specifically about some of those high risk circumstances that make things more technically challenging. And then there's a few adjunct maneuvers that I think most of us can uh, ultimately learn that may help mitigate some of those problems and circumstances. So we've already heard this is obviously a preferred method of feeding access. It's very common, it's been around for 40 years. We do it 100,000 times a year, it takes 15 minutes. So why are we spending two sessions over two days talking about it? Because there's still lots of problems that come along with it. We know that in some extenuating circumstances, patients have a higher failure rate, they have a higher complication rate, and sometimes uh, surgeons just look at a patient and say, like, no way, I'm not even gonna try. And I hope that at the end of this talk, maybe you see some of those people who you may have said no way, and you say, hey, maybe. Like, let's take a look and see what we can do in those circumstances. Um, ultimately, though, putting a square peg in a round hole is not what I want you to do, okay? I want you guys to figure out which person to put the right peg in at the right time. Uh, and I also want to remind everybody, this is one of my lines, all the residents know this, nobody ever says nice peg. You put a peg in, it goes well, nobody compliments you. You put a peg in, it goes wrong, and everybody says, dude, it was a peg, how did, you, how did it go wrong? It's a 15 minute procedure, right? You never get credit for doing it right, you only get grief when it goes wrong. So when, I, when the residents call me, basically they know, like, just, just tell Paula these like eight things, okay? Does the patient need a peg? Does the mouth connect to the stomach? Do they have an uncontrolled coagulopathy? We care about coagulopathy because bleed, PEG is considered a high-risk endoscopic procedure for bleeding, so we want to mitigate those circumstances. Do they have ascites? Uh, do they have difficult anatomy, right? Like this person here who, no joke, someone put a PEG in this person. You may notice there's a lot of contrast in the colon because it mostly went into the colon. Like this is predictable ahead of time by just looking at the patient. Um, you know, is there stuff overlying the PEG site? Uh, and finally, this is my favorite one, does the patient have what we call a pugilist sign, right? If the patient is wearing boxing mitts in, in their room, they're high risk for pulling this thing out. So just, I ask them that, do they have a pugilist sign? So in the obese patient, um, the main issues that I think about are number one, issues with airway management, okay? If you're doing your own sedation, you wanna have an understanding, is this person gonna be okay? These patients are supine, they're obese, they've got a big neck, so if you need anesthesia help, get anesthesia help. Secondly, you're gonna have some issues with translumination, and the question ultimately is, is the translumination issue just abdominal wall fat, uh, or is there really something in the way? Like, is there a liver in the way, okay? This isn't what you don't wanna see. You don't wanna see a peg tube in the middle of the liver on a post-operative imaging study. Uh, I will point out, though, that you can actually do that same complication on people who are not obese. Uh, this is a peg tube that goes through the left lateral segment on a patient who clearly that shouldn't have happened on if you're looking for transillumination, okay? So the, you know, the steps of this procedure should be repeatable in everybody, and if you're not passing step one, which is transillumination, you've gotta to go to some adjunct maneuver. And so in the obese patient who you can't transilluminate, the next thing that I like to go to is fluoroscopy. We saw a great lecture about how fluoro is an adjunct for radiologists to place gastrostomy tubes. Surgeons use fluoroscopy. You can use it for pegs without really much difficulty, and I would encourage you all to consider that as an adjunct maneuver. Um, the images are gonna look just like the images that Iran showed earlier, right? You've got a gastrostomy tube in place. You've got, I'm sorry, you've got an endoscope in place. We're insufflating, we've got our radiographic marker. We can see the transverse colon below. We put a gastrostomy tube in even if we don't have the ability to clearly transilluminate here because now we've got some uh, adjunct maneuvers to help us figure this out. Hiatal hernia patients, the number one consideration that I ask when the patient, when I'm told the patient has a known hiatal hernia is, you know, have they been aspirating, okay? People get concerned that they need to do a jejunal extension or do a J-tube on these patients because they have a hiatal hernia. And the literature does not support that. The only time that we're gonna do a jejunal extension or just go to a straight J-tube is if the hiatal hernia has been documented to be the reason for the aspiration. And I gotta be honest, even in some of those circumstances, I don't necessarily just jump to that maneuver. The questions we ask are, what type of hiatal hernia, right? Some hiatal hernias should be repaired, right? If you see a type two hiatal hernia, that's a high risk for incarceration. We might consider doing a repair on that, even in a patient who's maybe not the best candidate. 
and place a gastrostomy at the same time. Similarly, if there's a type 4 and there's colon up in the chest, the same thing. You might consider, hey, maybe we should reduce gastropexy and place a gastrostomy on that person. Um, I also look at, you know, one of, one of my things is, are there adjunct images for us to look at? That's a question we ask the residents. I'm not saying go get images, but what I am saying is, if there is an image, you better have looked at it, because if you see a gastro, an NG tube that's mostly up in the chest in a big air fluid level, you know already that this person's a high risk for failure. Doesn't mean I'm not going to try, it just means I'm thinking about maybe I should have fluoro, maybe we're going to do other stuff beyond just place a peg today. Um, Again, here's a patient who's got an elevated hemidiaphragm from ALS. It's a, you know, it's a hiatal hernia equivalent. The entire stomach is above the level of the costal margin. And here's a spot where you know, radiology placed peg tubes, which is what's going on here, uh, are going to fail because of the inability to push that stomach down endoscopically. Uh, this is a video of how I do an endoscopic reduction of a hiatal hernia. So this patient has a large type 3 hiatal hernia. And what you're seeing me do is this uh, reverse J maneuver where we retroflex on the greater curve of the stomach. And we're going to basically just push. And what you're seeing me do here is I'm endoscopically reducing the stomach out of the chest. All right. So we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing. We're getting it all the way down. We're straightening the stomach out so that when, then we can place a gastrostomy because now the stomach is in an anatomically normal position and it's actually all below the diaphragm and now I can place a peg tube on that person. But when I do that maneuver, I usually don't just place one peg tube. I usually place two peg tubes or I place, uh, like that's, that's what that looks like, the double peg uh, or we, uh, we place uh, multiple points of, of fixation. So you see some T anchors here and in between the middle of the two anchors, the two T anchors right here, what you're seeing is actually a permanent transfascial suture that I just use a laparoscopic suture passer to go down so that I've got multi-point permanent fixation on the stomach so it can't volvulize and it can't go back up into the chest. And obviously using fluoro and colonoscopy are other adjuncts if you've got somebody who's got a big distended uh, stomach and you need to push it out of the chest with a, colon with a colonoscope, you can do that. So moving on to ascites, the first question we ask is what's the reason for the ascites? If the patient has cirrhosis with uncontrolled ascites and a bunch of big vessels in their mesentery, the answer is probably going to be a no. But it's not always a hard no just because they have ascites. Patients with loculated ascites, like this patient here who's got metastatic cancer and is vomiting, there's really not much ascites around the stomach. And even if I infect that little bit of ascites, it's not going to be diffuse peritonitis. So this person I'm, I'm much more willing to do it on. The other question, though, with... with um, with portal hypertension is, are there other problems that come along with it, right? Don't put a peg through the spleen if it's big, okay? I shouldn't, you know, I mean, that, that's a bad problem. And obviously, abdominal wall varices as well are things that make you say, hey, maybe we should be thinking about other adjuncts to get feeding access on this person. Um, in, that, in those circumstances, you can consider, this was asked as a question yesterday, so I thought I'd put the slide in, you can consider doing a percutaneous transesophageal endoscopic gastrostomy tube, which is an endoscopic-assisted approach through the left neck to place a feeding tube for decompression or feeding access in somebody whose abdomen is just totally, totally unapproachable. Uh, and, and this is just some T-anchors going in, which I'll skip in the interest of time. Uh, following gastric bypass, when I get a request for a PEG, the first question is, do you actually want feeding access in the stomach, or are you just using that term because you want feeding access? So we could do a PEG or a PEG in those people. If you want a PEG, what we have to do is push enteroscopy or double balloon enteroscopy to go retrograde into the bypass stomach. And once we're there, we're going to do a Russell introducer method with some gastrointestinal T anchors and then a wire access, a dilating sheath, and then a tube uh, in under direct endoscopic visualization. Uh, if you want a PEDGE, that's pretty easy. We just review the op note and we figure out where the alimentary limb is. And obviously an anti-colic, anti-gastric bypass, which is what you're seeing here, is going to be the easiest. And on this patient who had a CT scan for some other reason and has an NG tube in place, you can actually see the spot where your PEG is going to go. It's going to go in the left upper quadrant, right where, right where it should normally be. So that's the placed PEDGE in the alimentary limb. One of the problems that I've found is if you have a tube in the left upper quadrant, it's a G-tube in size. I know it's a PEDGE, but nobody else will. They're going to bolus feed that patient. They may aspirate because their pouch is small. We don't want that. So I'll sometimes add a jejunal extension downstream so that people don't get bolus fed. The other thing that I do is when I pull these tubes out, if the patient's going to be eating normally again, uh, I will actually always close that tract endoscopically. So I'll scope. I'll do a cut and push, and then extract the bumper through the mouth, and then I'll use an endoscopic clip to close the defects so that they don't have a persistent fistula that they'll leak out from a high rate. 
I'll conclude here with overlying structures. You know, this is a CT scan on a patient who's got colon overlying it and was told by um, our GI folks who were asked to see him because of this CT scan, not a candidate for a PEG. So I said, we're going to take him, we're going to do a PEG, and we're just using fluoro. And as you can see, I did no other maneuvers. I just insufflated, and the colon is out of the way. So don't just look at a scan and say you need, you know, you reject somebody because there's colon nearby. This is a patient who, like you saw uh, uh, Iran do earlier, we were doing a colonoscopy to decompress the colon uh, to get it out of the way. Um, there are obviously lots of things that can be in your way, like VP shunts, uh, LVAD devices, and drive lines. You want to make sure that you're using fluoro so that you don't put a PEG tube through a drive line. Again, I assure you that's a bad thing to do. So in conclusion, uh, a lot of these problems that I showed you can be anticipated based off of just a, a pretty brief preoperative assessment. And, and by knowing what you're getting into, you can mitigate a lot of problems. But if you, you know, you, if you can use fluoro, if you can use a colonoscope, if you can place T-anchors, you can mitigate a lot of these people who have been deemed non-peggable and basically extend the reach of enteral feeding access in your practice. Thank you very much.